A few weeks ago, I had a very strange dream. It didn't involve zombies or monsters or anything weird like that. It was me attending a very horrible playtesting session, where developers kept taking the controller out of my hand, they were overly explaining things, nothing was good going on. And then when it was all over, the developer cursed me out and said thanks for nothing. And Dream Josh was so offended that for today's critical thought, we're going to talk about the importance and role of playtesting. Well, you should be striving for what your goal is, so you can make Dream Josh and Normal Josh very happy. At its very best, playtesting provides a very important function to show off your game to people and get important information about what does it look like for someone to play your game and what do they think about it. At its very worst, however, you can be wasting everyone's time, or if you're paying for Q&A, you are wasting money. And it's important to understand how the role of playtesting and what you should be playtesting evolves over the course of your game's development. And that's a very important tip, or our first tip for today's video. There is not a single game out there that only had literally one Q&A session done. In fact, for every developer watching this, let me know how many of your games worked out really well with only just having one playtesting session done during the entirety of the development. And I apologize for causing any mental pain with that sentence. Now, as I said, playtesting at its basic level is about getting eyes and hands on your game. And as you're going through the development, you're going to be looking at or focusing on different aspects of it. So if we're talking about very much step one or step zero. So this is a prototype. This is a build that maybe there's a little bit of gameplay. There's probably not any or nowhere near any completed art in your game. You are just trying to get eyes on a mechanic or system you want to test. In this respect, you want to be showing this obviously to close people. This is not the time to be going to get paid uh, QA testers to look at your game. What you're trying to do at this stage of playtesting is figure out whether or not you have an idea that's worth exploring. And it sounds very simple when I say it like that. You just want to know people like your idea. But this is oftentimes one of the hardest things for a developer to figure out, especially if you are a new or first time one. Because I'm assuming you like your game idea. But what does it look like in front of other people? Now, the thing you want to also pay attention to is that there's some aspects of feedback that aren't important at this stage. If someone's complaining about the art of your version 00001 prototype, yeah, you can pretty much write that off of right now. If someone says that your gameplay is confusing or they hate how it plays, however, that's something you should be keeping in mind. And at this early stage, you're just trying to see what people think about it. This is oftentimes why game jams can oftentimes be a really solid test bed for game prototypes. If a a game jam version of your game takes home top prize or top five where everyone can't stop talking about just this iteration of it, that's a good sign that you have something worth developing. And again, we have seen games from the likes of Super Hot, Forager, I'm sure there's plenty others that come to mind that were given birth just because people really liked that prototype. So let's fast forward a little bit. So. People liked your game, first rounds were okay, maybe you didn't even do any first rounds, maybe you just wanted to pursue this further, and you now have a basic build. There should be some are reasonably done, mechanics should be there. Most likely you haven't really settled or you haven't fully solidified your UI UX yet, and it's time to start getting more impressions. So this is the part of development where your game is kind of at its most malleable. We know you're making a game. But we don't know exactly where it's going to completely end up, obviously at the end of development. This is where you're going to be probably doing multiple playtest sessions. And it's important to get your money and your time's worth out of it. Some people will think that 
it's okay to run multiple play testing sessions after literally every single thing you fix. Okay, I raise a platform on level two. Let's do play testing. Okay, now I change this platform from blue to yellow. Let's do play testing. It doesn't work that way, especially if you're relying on your community to play test your game. Because you want people to be giving you the most honest and most direct feedback. And that means another aspect of good playtesting is understanding the goal or element you want to get playtested. So when you're in the middle of development, if you've already settled on your art style, let's say you haven't settled on your art style yet, then you want to make it very clear that, well, I don't want to hear any feedback about the art. If you're focusing on how the jump physics are on your platformer, then create a build that's just going to be testing jumping. You want, again, to give a direction to your playtesters. And it's very easy to get in that mindset that, oh, well, if I keep making changes, people will keep coming back to playtest and playtest. But again, it's very easy to wear someone out, especially if you're not paying them, if all you're doing is making minute changes. Now, if we're talking about a major change, like... We're going to remove double jumping in this build, or let's say we're completely redoing our combat system in this RPG, then yes, that is definitely a call for playtesting. But again, you want to have a specific goal for each stage or each round of playtesting. And as your game gets further and further in development, you're going to have more things you want to juggle. Again, if it's your very first actual playable prototype build, we don't care about art. If this is 80% done or 70 to 80% finish, it's probably time to get people to look at how your aesthetics and art are. And you do not want to wait until your game is 80% finished to start thinking about your art style. And I completely apologize for giving every indie developer watching this PTSD with that statement. Now, when you're trying to get people to play test. That is another tricky point for some of you watching this. It may be as easy as going to a game dev night or to a forum you visit and say, hey, I got a prototype. Would you like to play it? For some of you out there, it's going to be probably along the lines of pulling teeth and trying to find a unicorn out on the streets in order to get people to play test. And unfortunately, this is one aspect that depending upon your own presence in terms of social media, in terms of game dev backgrounds, and even in terms of where you are located, is going to greatly determine how hard or how easy it's going to be. This is why, again, as we've always said, that networking is such a major aspect when it comes to game dev, and especially social media presence. So let's say you have that amazing GIF that just is just a fantastic showing of your game. It's something you put on social media and everyone goes, oh my god, can you believe this video game? And then you say, hey, you like this amazing GIF I just posted? We need people to play tests. You are going to get flooded with requests. If no one knows who you are, you've posted nothing about your game, you have no connections whatsoever, and you say, I'm looking for people to play test my game, most likely you're not going to get anyone. And again, if we're talking about how to build social media presence, how to get your name out there, that's a few more videos and we'll need some guests to discuss that one. I think we may even did a round table on that. But let's say for our, the sake of our lesson here that you have people willing to play tests. And again, we're not talking about paid Q&A at this point. But you have fans, you have people that saw something you post and they want to play test your game. As you're going through development, again, you want to have specific goals set up for what you want tested. And that also means making builds that will exemplify what you want play tested. If you don't care about jumping, then if you're trying to just test a combat system or an RPG system, have a build where that's going to be the focus, or take out certain stages of your uh, prototype build that you don't want people to look at. 
because whatever you show them when you're playtesting, whether you want them to or not, they're going to take that and parse that when they're trying to give you feedback. As I said a few minutes ago, if your art is not finished, then the worst thing you can do is just present a build that has all the most horrible art because that's what people are going to harp on. And that's even going to color their perspective when they're talking about other aspects of the game. You can use placeholder art, you can use temporary art, but you need to inform the person that that's what it's there for. And again, as your game gets further and further along, you're going to need to test different aspects of it. And again, this is also going to be highly dependent on the game you're making. Playtesting a platformer is going to be very different than playtesting a grand strategy 4X game. Although I'm sure they're both completely the same in terms of gameplay, right? So let's say that we're moving along in this process. It's time to talk about the pool of testers, who you're looking to playtest your game. And as I've said over the course of this video, what you're looking to playtest and who you want to playtest your game is going to change as your game goes through development. If we are talking about step zero, the very first prototype, very first Q&A session, you want to make sure that these are people who at least know what is going on because you are nowhere near the position yet to be talking about UI UX, about approachability and accessibility. You need to make sure right at the get-go that if I'm building a first-person shooter, does someone who gets first-person shooting actually like this game? Because if they don't, and that is your intention, then something has gone terribly wrong. But as we get further into development, you're going to want to approach new people and fresh eyes on your game. People who have not played the last 3, 5, 10, 15 iterations of your prototype. And even people who may not even play your genre. And this is one of the aspects of playtesting that I think may fly over a few developers' heads. If I'm making a first-person shooter, why do I care if uh, someone has never played a first-person shooter before? Who has no idea what Doom is or Call of Duty? We well, see, this is when we get to the UI UX and one of the major cornerstones of good playtesting. Because the only way you're going to see how your game is being conceived and how the UI UX of your game is going to work is if you show to someone who has never touched the genre. If you remember the famous talk George Fan gave about Plants vs. Zombies and having his mother figure it out, he used the impressions and input from his mother in terms of, is someone who has never touched the genre before, can they at least understand what is going on? Now, I honestly don't know if George Fan's mother beat the entirety of Plants vs. Zombies. If I ever talk to him again, I'll have to ask. But he at least made sure that she understood the tutorial and what was going on with the UX of that game. The problem is that as someone becomes more acclimated to your game, who has played every single playtesting session, who has followed every single bit of news, certain things are going to be afforded to them. If they're already a master at first person shooting, they'll naturally know that R is for reload, C is for crouch or control, depending upon <laughs> how you play. But if you show that to a new person, and you have no onboarding about how crouching works or everyone's favorite, how crouch jumping works, well, people are going to get stuck. And when they get stuck, they're going to stop playing. And if your playtesters are getting annoyed at your game, then I can guarantee you that consumers are going to get annoyed as well. Now, as you keep going through playtesting and iterating on each one of your ideas, it's always going to be good to have new and old eyes on it for this very reason. And it's again why it can be very difficult, especially as an indie developer, to get UI UX done. Because it's going, each time you do playtesting, you are kind of removing new potential Q&A testers from your pool of friends, family, and uh, community members. So 
there will probably come a time if you are really trying to, you know, get as much Q&A done to maybe hire a dedicated Q&A tester or a Q&A testing department. Especially if you have a publisher who may be able to get eyes on the game or show to people like that. And as we've said, ultimately the goal of this is you're looking for feedback. And that takes me to the last part of our video. How do you get feedback and how do you parse feedback? Another easily uh, stumble point for developers is how do they collect the feedback from people? Again, if you have paid testers on staff, you're probably going to set up a uh, forum or messaging board or a bug report system to get feedback and get impressions from them. This was something that I did when I did some work or I was just playing around with some of the games from Arkin that I posted a lot of feedback and issues that I found with some of their games. Now, if we're talking about getting impressions from people who aren't being paid by you, it's oftentimes really good. And this is something I talked with, uh, I think, John Brieger about. We discuss recording play sessions, recording how someone is looking as they're playing your game. What are they actually, like, looking at the screen? Where is the mouse cursor going? You don't want to be in the room, you know, staring at them like this while they're playtesting. Another pro tip, don't be staring directly at someone while they're playtesting your game. That's going to make it very hard for them to concentrate on the title. And what you're looking for in these sessions is you want to see how someone reacts to your game. Is something that you thought was easy to do confusing them? Are people getting stuck at a specific session? And this is where you want to kind of try to get to record them to do something or record their thoughts. Are people, again, getting frustrated? What is the feedback about certain things? And when it's time to kind of open things up, and this is when we have public beta testing sessions, early access impressions, and so on, now comes probably the hardest part of all of this, understanding feedback. Because, as we've said before, the following two sentences are equal in terms of how much good feedback they give you. First sentence is, this game is horrible, you're a lousy developer, please go kill yourself. The second sentence is, this is the best game ever, I have no complaints, I will play this every day until the day that I die. What exactly did you get useful from either one of those sentences? Now, some of you may only think about that positive sentence, but you see overwhelmingly positive responses don't help you in terms of churn rates, in terms of divly spikes, in terms of UI UX. You want to see where people are, even if it's just a minor inconvenience, or where they're having issues with your game. Now, when you open things up when it comes to playtesting, one of the most easily found situations is that you will get 10 different people with 10 different complaints and all 10 complaints have one solution to them. And this is where it takes a good design mind and a good understanding of feedback as a designer to kind of deduce what's going on. If you get five responses from playtesters and they all along the lines of, I can't beat this boss. Why am I not able to dodge these attacks? This combat system is terrible. Boss fights overpowered. This game sucks. Or even something like, uh, let's see, enemies do too much. Or I know, here's another one. Enemy too hard. That's, I know, some really good feedback there. Taken individually, it can be a little bit hard to figure out what is going on. But when we put all those together, we can start to get an idea that something about the combat system or how the player is able to respond or not to respond to enemies is at fault. And it's going to be up to you to figure out how to make these changes. Because another aspect when it comes to playtesting is that it's going to open up your game to feedback. And as I said a minute ago, there are some developers out there who only view positive feedback as worthwhile to listen to. And that is a very dangerous mindset to have, especially if you're doing Q&A. 
when you are opening up your game to people to critically or uncritically review and talk about your game, you need to take every feedback in. Even if someone says that your game is horrible or they have no idea what's going on or this is the worst game ever. Because when you start putting all your feedback together, it is possible to start getting a message about your game. If 10% of your playtesters or 10% of the people who play your game, their only response is, this game sucks, you're a lousy developer or quick game dev. And then another 20 to 30% say, I'm having a hard time with combat, or I can't jump right, or these sections are frustrating. You can start again to paint this picture as to why are people not responding to my game? And as I've said over the course of this video, when we talk about the purpose of playtesting, it's about one very simple thing. You want to make sure that your game is as bug-free, as pain point free, and as bestly designed to your capability as you can before you slap 1.0 and finish on your game. The absolute nightmare scenario for developers is to release your game and all the bugs, all the problems, all the pain points that you didn't figure out or you don't even know about are now filling your Steam forms, and everyone is making YouTube videos about how horrible this game is. And again, I apologize for giving a few of you PTSD on that sentence. But this is again why playtesting matters. Because catching issues with your game before it hits 1.0 is an entirely different story than catching those issues after release. And even to another point, Catching them before you go to early access. If you know that there are major issues with your game, major problems with bugs or crashes, or maybe even your entire combat system is flawed, do not put that on early access. Because if your very first early access build is terrible, that is going to taint the well of any future interest and feedback in your game. When you go on early access, it should be as competently finished and bug free as you can possibly make it before you let the consumer base swarm in. And we talk about early access, that's another 20 to 30 minutes on this video. So to wrap things up, playtesting is one of the unsung heroes of game development. Every game whether it is a simple match 3, a bubble bobble clone, your attempt at No Man's Sky meets, uh, I don't know, uh, Stellaris, it needs playtesting done. The more playtesting you get done, the more focused playtesting you get done will ultimately help your game and allow you to get fresh perspectives on how it plays. Again, if your very first playtesting with all temporary art with just basic things on screen and people love it, that is a good sign that you have something. And if you can keep that momentum, if you keep improving and iterating on it, then you are really ahead of the game. But it's also important when you're doing playtesting to also point out things that cannot be changed, things that are set in stone. If you're building I don't know, a gothic horror game, and you're using kind of moody graphics or, you know, uh, Lovecraftian themes, and people say, hey, can you make this a bright and colorful cartoon game? That's not going to happen. But if people are complaining that it's hard to see or they're having trouble figuring out where they're going, that could be a sign to change something. And it's always important to know when to bend and when to hold when it comes to design and aspects of it. Some aspects of your game are going to be set in stone and then encased in metal and then thrown to a volcano and will never be removed. And some aspects you can change and pick and choose and move them around however you see fit. But it's important as always to have a game plan when you go into game development and a plan for what you want people to play test and what kind of feedback you are looking for. 
As one final pro tip before we end this video, remember this. If you ever go up to a consumer or a playtester and you utter these words, it's not the game's fault, you're doing it wrong. Something is not right about your game. And this whole video has just been me, I think, giving PTSD to every indie developer and student developer watching this. So hopefully all of you, you may want to go lie down or maybe go get something to eat after watching this. But thank you so much for tuning in. Do all the YouTubing stuff, liking, subscribing. Be sure to visit our Discord and Patreon. And come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where we examine the art and science of games.